this research has really helped inform numerous efforts to support early childhood education, and we'll now hear about one of them, the Bipartisan Policy Center's Early Childhood Initiative. To learn more about this important bipartisan effort to improve the quality of early learning programs and sustain investment in proven programs, we're now joined by Linda Smith, director of BPC's Early Childhood Initiative. Linda most recently served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development in the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services, where she provided overall policy coordination for the Head Start and Early Head Start programs and the Child Care and Development Fund. She's had an extensive career in early childhood education policy from working to establish child care programs at the local level and within Native American communities to strengthening early childhood programs offered by the Department of Defense. She's a national advocate in the field, and we're so grateful she's here with us today to share the important work her team is doing at BPC. Linda? Um, thank you so much, and thank you to Nickham for inviting me to be a part of this. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about early childhood to, this, to the health community. What I wanted to do was to just, this is just an overview of what I'm going to talk about, who we are here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, an overview of early care and education in the country, some basic assumptions, and looking at the intersect between federal role in ECE and the state funding of it and how, what uh, recommendations we are making to um, the, the government both at the state and the federal level. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Bipartisan Policy Center, we are a nonprofit organization here in Washington, D.C. that tries to combine the best ideas from both sides of the aisle to promote the health and the opportunity for all Americans. Um, in addition to early childhood, I, on the slide you'll see some of the other issues we work on, health, energy, uh, housing, immigration, and a few others. Um, we do our work through um, basically putting together bipartisan groups uh, that will take a look, that will work on issues such as early childhood. One of the more interesting ones, I think, for this audience is when we started this work here at BPC in 2017, we had a task force co-chaired by former Senator Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania and former California Representative George Miller, a somewhat unlikely duo. Um, to say the least. Um, so what we're trying to do here at BPC right now is to look at, if you look at the second bullet on this slide, um, is to look at how we create a comprehensive and sustained approach to improving the quality of early care and education. And the two key words in this slide are um, the uh, sustained and comprehensive approach to this. Uh, much of the efforts in the United States have been rather random um, in approaching early care and education and looking at one, one slice of it. And we know that in order to make progress in, in ECE, we're going to have to take on this, this in a comprehensive fashion. So next we're going to do an overview of what early care and education looks like in the country. And I think these, some of these statistics I'm not going to read to you, but I think they speak for themselves. And I will say that I, I put information on these slides because I know the slides are going to be posted later on and I thought the information might be helpful to the audience, even though I'm not going to read all of this to you, but just set the stage knowing that. Um, roughly 60% of our children under, between birth and five are in at least one weekly non-parental care setting in this country. That is a lot of children in these settings. Um, the settings are very expensive for our families. If you look at the next one, 20% is the average they pay of their weekly household income. That ranges from anywhere 26% for low-income families down to 10% for higher income. We have a very complicated workforce with about 2 million paid teachers and caregivers in a variety of settings, and I'm going to show you what they are in just a second. But despite the high cost of, of care, the median pay for a child care worker in this country is less than $12 an hour, and that shows you roughly $22,000 a year, which is essentially poverty level wages in this country. Many of them qualify for uh, various public programs themselves, including food stamps, et cetera. Um, and about 20% of the workforce in early care and education, according to the last survey that data that we have, 
um, lack any kind of health insurance at all. And then the last point just tells you what the impact of the early care and education um, field is on the uh, economics of this country. So in terms of just wanted to focus a little bit more in on infants and toddlers because that is where we have such a critical shortage of care and in this country. And as the previous speaker said, about 25% uh, of our new mothers are going back to work within two weeks of giving birth, which is in and of itself a problem in this country and one that there's some work going on already on, on paid leave and, and especially maternity and paternity leave. Um, but because the, these years are so critically important, and as was brought out in the previous briefing, the quality matters, and it matters most to uh, children from low-income families, and it really matters for infants and toddlers. So I think we've got to be, be thinking about how we approach um, this problem, especially in the infant-toddler spectrum, over the coming years. It's a, it's a crisis for our families right now. Um, it's a crisis in part because the cost of it, in order to do early care and education well, we need to have good infant or good ratios between the adults and the children they care for because adult-child interactions are key to just about everything. With that being said, that drives up the cost. So, for example, in infant care, uh, infant infant child infant caregiver relation, uh, ratios are roughly one to four across in most states. If you think about what then that takes to pay that that provider, whoever that is. Um, that doesn't give you a lot of income if, if looking down at the next level you're seeing that an infant, uh, the cost of care for an infant is 11. So take 11 times 4 and you're at, you're at roughly 40,000 and that doesn't, you know, that has to cover the cost of food, equipment, supplies, facilities and everything else. So that's why we're really in a rut in terms of how we begin to pay for this. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute here. Um, I want to talk first about some basic assumptions because sometimes, it, you know, I get into conversations with people about this issue, and and there's always a, there's a perception in some places in our country as to child care, whether or not it's early learning, and of course it's early learning, as the the slide says. Children are learning 24-7, and every environment that they're in is a critical environment in the first few years of life. So child care is early learning, and what I generally say to people about it in terms of the quality of it, it can be good or it can be bad. And so the, the determining factor is, you know, whether or not it's good, not whether or not it's, it's, it's educational. So the next assumption is that parents are so important in the first few years of life to what happens with children, and I think that goes without saying, and I don't have to say it to this audience. But I do think that for the most part, parents, we th seem to think that we can take a child, put them in an early learning setting, and it will all work magic, and it won't work without the engagement of parents. And so uh, we put a lot of focus on those in our work here, and think we need to have a more active conversation with parents across the country about the issue of early care and learning. In the next slide, I put this out here because we have been working on the issue of child care facilities in this country. And these are just a couple of pictures taken from an HHS Office of Inspector General uh, report issued a few years ago where they went out and did unannounced um, inspections of child care facilities in 10 states. This is the kind of thing we have going on in some of our child care facilities, and, and we've got plenty more where these pictures came from. We need to begin to address the environments that our children are in, and we've all dealt with some of the issues around lead and asbestos, et cetera, but we do have a significant problem with infrastructure. And so these, the health and safety in these programs can lay the groundwork for a lot of things that are yet to come in children's lives. And finally, this is an important thing for the healthcare world because developmental screenings are just really so important to identifying potential delays. And when delays are identified early enough, um, 
there are a lot of things that we can do within early childhood to help children move along the developmental spectrum. But if these things go without being screened, um, they just compound the problems that children have later on. So what I want to do now is talk to you a little bit about what early care and education looks like in this country. I think we tend to think of cute little preschool classrooms um, where children are busy and doing things, and that's the ideal that we want to all strive for. But within the early care and education system in the United States, we have a variety of options. Um, and not all of them are in centers as people envision when they think about the, the preschool years. Millions of parents are using their, some of the options that I show here. We have centers run by national and regional companies, as well as small centers run by individual small businesses in communities. We have care going on such as family child care or home-based care. We have care in, a lot of care in faith-based settings, part-day pre-K in schools and other settings and then individual caregivers who go into the home, such as nannies and relatives. So it's, it is a, a really varied um, system that we have, and it, it is complicates you know, what, how to improve the quality because it is, there is such variation in, in what we have out there. In recent years, we have seen a real increase in the number of children in center-based care, as the, the chart shows here. Uh, close to 60% in center-based care now, moving away from other forms of care, but still a lot of children, especially younger children in the in-home settings. Um, just to take a look at some of the other things, some families have access to publicly funded programs such as Head Start and Early Head Start or public pre-K. Um, but the problem in, in that, in that it's special piece of the, our market is that these are, generally speaking, part-day, part-year programs, and most families work full-day year-round. And so we have a situation where we have many parents who are working full-time relying on multiple arrangements for children to meet their needs. This is particularly challenging for low-income families, and it also uh, is one of the reasons I've, I've had this question frequently about uh, about the part-day preschool effort and why more children aren't in in those, in those settings. Well, poor families cannot take off work at noon to go transport their children from one program to another. So they tend to not use some of the things that would benefit some of our children the most. Uh, so we also have a problem, as the slide shows, there was a recent study released in Pennsylvania that looked at the non-traditional hours of care, and in that one study, there's roughly one slot for every three families that um, need that type of care. A lot of our lower income families work non-traditional hours, and this is a particularly challenging aspect of early care and education for them. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the federal role in early care and education, because I think in many cases the public is not as aware of where the funding is coming from for what is happening around the country. As noted in this slide, the federal government is the largest funder of early care and education programs in the country. No question about it. Eighty percent on average of all money being spent in early care and education comes from the federal level or is driven by federal um, requirements. So that is a particular problem out there. And that intersect between these two things gets to be um, challenging. Um, because many people at the state level do not understand the background of where the money is coming from. So we have been trying to take a look at this and to try and figure out how do we begin to, as I get, go back to the first slide of what we're trying to do here at BPC, is figure out how we are going to sustain um, a, a high quality early care and education system in this country. It's got to start with figuring out how to, how to do the funding of it. Um, so if you begin to, we have basically looked, started to, to look at this intersection between the major funding streams and what's going on in the states, as I said. So at the federal level, most early education money f th flows through the Department of Health and Human Services. 
um, in FY19, as you're going to see in another slide, roughly uh, $19 billion came through those two programs of Head Start and the Child Care Development Fund. Um, they account for about 90% of overall funding it's coming from the federal government. Um, and then I think in addition to that, as you know, most of our states now, 45 states and the District of Columbia, are spending state and local funds on state pre-K programs for three and four-year-olds. Those programs primarily are, as I said, are part day, part year. And um, but they do all try to do the same thing, and it gets back to children learning 24-7. If they're in a part day preschool or in a full day child care, they are, not, they, are, they are all learning. So this just looks at the funding streams and the amount of money going into those. Um, and I put this in here for reference for you. One of the things that we have been doing here at the Bipartisan Policy Center is to look at those federal programs and look at the, how the states are using the money. So if you look at the GAO in 2017 published a report where they looked at the primary funding sources coming from the federal government to try to identify um, where there were inefficiencies in the program. In Washington, at the federal level and in Congress, especially in Congress, there is a perception that there's plenty of money out there if, this, if we were all just more efficient with the money. Uh, we set out to answer the question, are there efficiencies in these program funding streams? And if so, where is that efficiency? Where can we gain that? Because this issue of stovepiping overlap, um, duplication of funding sources has been a barrier at times to us having conversations here and at the state level about increasing the funding for early care and education. So with that in mind, we, we looked at this. Um, Despite the fact, though, that we have, you know, that much money, as you saw in the previous slide, going into these programs, um, we cannot meet the needs of families around this country. And I think that is where we really are, as I say, stuck. Head Start reaches only 31% of eligible children, and early Head Start, 7%. So that's a very small number of poor um, children in the early Head Start program. The Child Care Development Fund served only in 2015 served only 15% of the eligible under federal rules and 25% of those under state rules. And I can explain that in a minute when we look at the, a chart about uh, the funding. But suffice it to say that there is not, no matter what we do, enough money in the system to provide the quality of care that we need in this country. So this chart um, looks at this issue of funding in a, on a state-by-state -state basis. And this came out of a GAO report that was done a couple of years mm -hmm. ago where we tried to work with GAO to get them to sort of identify how much of the need was being met. The federal requirements for child care funding state that, that children up to 85% of state median income are eligible. However, the states have the ability to meet, adjust that eligibility within uh, as long as they don't exceed it. So this chart shows you where the states set the eligibility as compared to the federal. And no state is close to meeting the federal eligibility. And that is why we have such a, you know, an, an, a crisis in, in child care, if you will. Um, and it's often, you know, basically a perception at a state level where a state will say we're meeting all of our eligibles. Well, if you set the eligibility low, then yes, you're going to meet the eligibility, but by no way are you meeting the needs of all of the children in your communities. So focusing on quality, as the previous speaker said, quality is such an important part of early care and education. Um, and it's often overlooked when it comes to, you know, the issue, how do, we, how do we get to quality programs when we are not investing enough money in some of the quality drivers that we have. So we estimate the cost of providing high quality infant toddler care somewhere between $12,000 and $21,000 annually. And we base that on the work that's been done on the Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships where we doubled the amount of money going into a child care provider's program per child and essentially got the quality up. 
So so how so well the quality costs somewhere in that range. The average subsidy payment for an infant through the Federal Child Care Development Fund is $6,800, roughly half of what it takes to get to quality. And therein lies our problem. We have this gap between what people are can afford or the federal government is paying in subsidy rates the states through the states and what it costs to do this well. So we're going to have to, over the next few years, figure out how we basically can, fi can fund this program so that at the same time we provide quality, we give our teachers a pay that they, can, they themselves can live on. So just looking at state funding quickly, because um, I know we're, we're getting close to out of time. Um, there, the issues around the states and what the states are putting in, uh, this, most of the states are putting money into public pre-K, and this slide shows you about what has gone on. There's been a big increase in state dollars going into pre-K. Uh, but again, it's a part-day, part-year program, mostly for fours and some threes. <laughs> Numbers are on the slide about how many of each of those age groups are served. And go back to those numbers of 12 million children, and we have a gap in where we are providing services to our children. This slide I wanted to just point out because I believe in public shaming, um, in that states when they get their child care development funds, they have to match some of their funds with state funds. And in some states when they don't match the money, the money is returned to the federal government and reallocated to other states. This shows in 2016 the four states that did not um, meet the, the match so they could not draw down all their money and they actually returned money to the federal government. Those states are up there. It's Idaho, Kansas, Michigan, and Tennessee. And we just want to encourage them, if, they, if we can, to um, match that federal dollar so their families can get the services. So we, the, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about um, and then get on to uh, a summary is what we've been trying to do here in looking at this fragmentation and overlap issue. We issued a report in 2018 looking at the state uh, systems around how they support early care and education and basically looked at how many departments are overseeing this. In this report, um, we have a profile of each of the states and you can see the report up there and you can link to it and link to your particular state about how you are organizing early care and education. With the assumption being that the more efficient the state is, the better off we are. So the state sheets are in there and I will say to the audience that we verified every state's data with someone in the state so that we got it right. We gave the states an opportunity to um, look at their data and tell us if we had it right or wrong. Um, I will tell you that there is a lot of flexibility at the state level. Uh, of the nine federal programs that were on the previous chart, this, it is completely up to the state um, in, for eight of those programs how they are administered. So whereas the governors and the state legislators sometimes think that they can't do anything about this and that the stove piping is caused by the federal government, it is not. And it is not caused by Congress either. It is strictly state decisions. So the next slide um, looks at the, in 29 states, there are three or more agencies administering these programs. So it, our premise is here that it is harder to coordinate and administer these things when they are not located and they are not, uh, they, they do not have some kind of common um, administration. And I would back, uh, back on that slide, the two biggest states um, in Texas and New York, there are five agencies administering the nine programs. Uh, the next one just looks at where, the, where there's a concentration, where they, are where they are located together. It shows kind of the opposite of the previous. So you look at the states that are most efficient. We were very happy when we did this work to, to see that this is not a red state or a blue state issue. It really is about leadership within states and how do we begin to manage the program. Okay, the next thing that I want to put on your radar screen radar. for people in the health world is that there are, are by law required 
states are required to have state advisory committees. Uh, this was re a requirement in the 2007-2007 uh, uh, Head Start reauthorization. Right now, 45 states have them. Um, these are state advisory councils, and I say that because the health and mental health agencies in the states are required to participate in these state advisory councils. And these state advisory councils can have major impact on quality decisions, on budget decisions, on how these programs are administered. So it's important that if you're in the health community, you find out if you're not involved with this work that you, take, you get involved with it. Finally, um, I want to just talk quickly about quality rating improvement systems. Um, we have in this country um, quality rating improvement systems. Sometimes these are, uh, are aligned with other things in the state and sometimes they're not. And so what we are trying to point out here is that licensing and quality rating improvement systems need to be linked because if they're not, we have created two different systems that are confusing to, ch to parents as well as to child care providers. So it's, this is a place where health community can get engaged and help us out. Um, we really need to align both the inspection process of early care and education programs as well as the standards. And if these programs are not linked, sometimes we have this, we have two different sets of standards, two different um, inspection requirements, et cetera. And we think that there's a lot that can be done to improve that. So um, just to summarize where we are on our work, we are making recommendations to governors and state policymakers about administering these programs. Generally speaking, we, we think that government does not do a very good job of reorganizing itself. So we're recommending to governors and, and state people to have an independent look at how you organize your programs to make sure that they're efficient for both families and for, for the child care providers working around in these programs, that you set up coordinated monitoring systems to ensure that, you, that your licensing and your, your uh, standards are at least aligned, if not the same and that you look at data integration. It's a very important thing and it's a tough one, we know that. For Congress, our recommendation, our biggest recommendation is to look at eligibility. That because if, if Congress is at fault for any reason on the issue of early care and education, it's because the eligibility requirements for participating in the programs vary widely. For example, child care is 85% of state median income for a family, but Head Start is poverty or below. So we're rec making some recommendations to Congress to align eligibility requirements. And then the final one is the integration and alignment of the early intervention system. Uh, that We try to take a look at how we align the Part B and Part C programs so that families with young children can stay eligible until school entry and get those early screening and support services that they need. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over and the slides will be available and if you have any questions um, at the end, we'd be happy to take them. And thanks again to Nickum for inviting me.